I turned it off, okay? It's important to know the context of what it is you're reading. And so today we're going to be starting a really exciting new series. But before I tell you what it is, I want to give you a quick history lesson. I want to give you the context, okay? That way we're not zoned off, you know, reading halfway through the page and we don't really understand the overall purpose of this story. We really understand the placement of this. And this story, this quick history lesson I'm going to give you is the entire history of Israel up until this point. It's very simplified, okay? It starts with Abraham. Abraham, he was called by God to leave his homeland and travel to an, a place called Canaan. Uh, this later became known as Israel. And God promises Abraham that his descendants will become a great nation. This is the covenant he made with Abraham. And so Abraham, he has a son Isaac, who has a son Jacob. And Jacob, he's an experience, of God, experience with God, wrestling with him, uh, where he gets a new name, Israel. And that name literally means wrestling with God. Jacob, or Israel, he has 12 sons. And one of them, Joseph, after uh, some pretty crazy events, actually comes to power in Egypt. And his family ends up settling there. Uh, some time elapses, and then we have the Egyptian, Egyptian bondage. And so over time, the Israelites, uh, they become enslaved in this land where they once had power. And so this period, it lasts for several centuries where God's people, Abraham's uh, descendants, they're all in the land of Egypt, but instead of in power, they're, they're in slavery. And then that is the backdrop for where we get Exodus and Moses. And so Moses, he was chosen by God. And because he was chosen by God and God empowers him, he leads the Israelites out of Egypt, the Exodus, and through the Red Sea. They receive the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai, Sinai, and this marks basically the birth of Israel as a nation. Okay, It was not just a people, not just a family, it was a whole nation at this point, bound by a covenant with God akin to the covenant made with Abraham. And so after that, we have for 40 years, this nation, this new fledgling nation is wandering in the wilderness, wandering in the wilderness for, for 40 years. Um, and in this per period, what Israel is basically learning to do is just trust and obey their God. And spoiler alert, they're, they're, they're struggling with it. But eventually, um, under Joshua's leadership, after a generation has passed, they lead a conquest into Canaan, uh, the previous uh, area where, where Abraham was called to go. And so um, they faced various battles in order to conquer this land, which was promised to God, uh, or promised by God to Abraham. And then after they're in the land, we have the period of the judges, okay? And so the period of the judges, they, they, these are leaders that emerged um, to lead and continually deliver Israel from all their surrounding enemies while they're here in the land. And so um, we see over and over again during this time the kind of the cycle of the judges. This is the cycle of sin, Israel sins. They receive oppression or judgment by God. They come to repentance and call out to God, and then finally God delivers it, them. Um, and we see this repeated over and over and over again. It seems like Israel doesn't learn their lesson. But eventually, after the period of the judges, uh, Israel decides they want a king. Okay, They want to be like the other nations. They want to be a kingdom, and so they appoint a king. Uh, this was Saul, then David, then Solomon. This is kind of considered the golden age of Israel, okay? And um, it's a good time. Uh, it establishes Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Uh, Solomon, he builds the first temple during this time. But then after Solomon, largely because of Solomon's sin, after Solomon's death, everything goes downhill, Okay? Um, and so the kingdom, it ends up splitting into two, a northern kingdom named Israel and a southern kingdom named Judah. And this leads to different kings, different kings governing each of these lands, uh, lots of conflict between the two, lots of the, most of the kings, not good kings, by the way. Um, and because we have this kind of divided king, kingdom, and uh, much of which is unfaithful, that leads us to the Assyrian and Babylonian captivity. And so because of sin, both of these kingdoms, both the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah are led into captivity by foreign nations. And so the northern kingdom of Israel, it falls to the Assyrians. And the slightly more faithful southern kingdom, Judah, it lasts a little longer, uh, but eventually they fall to the Babylonians. They're conquered by the Babylonians, and many of them, many, many Jews, are sent in exile to Babylon. That is the backdrop for today. That finally brings us to the book we're beginning this week. We'll be in for a few months, Ezra and Nehemiah. And so we're going to look at Ezra and Nehemiah together. 
Uh, the reason for that is even though in most of your modern Bibles these are probably two separate books, originally they were unified. They were typically on the same scroll, and so we're going to be looking at Ezra and Nehemiah together. Um, it was originally a united work, and we, we see that because whenever we look at these books together, we see a unified story. And so we're going to be beginning in Ezra chapters 1 through 2 today, if you want to turn there. But even though we're opening the book of Ezra today, I want you to know this, this book doesn't start with him. Uh, actually, we're not going to meet Ezra until chapter 7, seven of the book of Ezra. And so instead, what we're going to read about today are the first Jews who came from this Babylonian exile of Judah in the southern kingdom, uh, returning back to Jerusalem a whole lifetime before Ezra. And so 50, 50 or so years before Ezra. And so the structure of this book, before we begin, I just want you to understand what it is we're walking into. The whole structure of Ezra and Nehemiah really focuses on three key leaders um, as they're rebuilding their home. Uh, Zerubbabel, Ezra, and then Nehemiah. And so we see Ezra in chapters one, th or uh, Zerubbabel in chapters one through six of Ezra. And he first led a large group back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Later in, later in chapters 7 through 10, about 60 years later, uh, Ezra arrived in Jerusalem to teach the Torah and rebuild the community. And then whenever we hit the book of Nehemiah, chapters 1 through 7, um, we're going to read about Nehemiah, who soon followed Ezra, who led the rebuilding of Jerusalem's walls. And with each of these leaders, this book is actually going to cover three different waves of Jews returning from Babylon to the promised land, back into Jerusalem. Um, and even though we're covering three big time periods, three big movements, there's, it's all telling one story. Okay, Before we get, begin, I want you to know this is all telling one story. This is the story. It's the restoration of God's covenant people according to his word. It's the restoration of God's covenant people according to his word. This is a word which they're now called afresh to obey. And so with that backdrop, with that context, we've read back a little bit on the paper so that we know where we are now. We're going to go ahead and read Ezra chapters 1 through 2 and study this together. And so if you would please stand for the reading of God's word. Beginning in chapter 1, the author writes, In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And let each survivor in whatever place he sojourns be assisted by the men of his place with silver and gold, with goods and with beasts, besides free will offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. And then rose up the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred up to go, uh, to, to go up to rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. And all who were about them aided them with vessels of silver, with gold, with goods, with beasts, and with costly wares, besides all that were freely offered. Cyrus the king also brought out the vessels of the house of the Lord that Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and placed in the house of his gods. Cyrus, king of Persia, brought these out in the charge of Mithridath, the treasurer, who counted them to Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. And this was the number of them. 30 basins of gold, 1,000 basins of silver, 29 censers, 30 bowls of gold, 410 bowls of silver, and 1,000 other vessels. All the vessels of gold and silver were 5,400, and these did Sheshbazar bring up when the exiles were brought up from Babylonia to Jerusalem. Chapter 2. Now these were the people of the province who came out of the captivity of those exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried captive to Babylonia. They, rest, they returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his own town. They came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Sariah, Realiah, Mordecai, Bilshan, Misbar, Bigvi, Rahum, and Banah. 
From the number of the men of the people of Israel, the sons of Parash, 2,172. The sons of Shephatiah, the sons of Arah, 775. The sons of Pahath Moab, namely the sons of Jeshua and Joab, 2,812. The sons of Elam, 1,254. The sons of Zatu, 945. The sons of Zakai, 760. The sons of Benai, 642. The sons of Babai, 623. The sons of Asgad, 1,222. The sons of Anakim, 666. The sons of Bigvi, 2,056. The sons of Aden, 454. The sons of Ader, namely of Hezekiah, 98. The sons of Bazai, 323. The sons of Jorah, 112. The sons of Hashem, 223. The sons of Gebar, 95. The sons of Bethlehem, 123. The men of Nedephah, 56. The men of Anathoth, 128. The sons of Asmaveth, 42. The sons of Kiriath Aram, uh, Chepera and Biroth, 743. The sons of Ramah and Geba, 200 and, uh, 621. The men of Michmas, 122. The men of Bethel and Ali, 223. The sons of Nabo, 52. The sons of Migbesh, 156. The sons of other Elam, 100, 1,254. The sons of Haram, 320. The sons of Lod, Headed, and Ono, 725. The sons of Jericho, 345. The sons of Sanaa, 3,630. The priests, the sons of Jediah, and the house of Jeshua, 973. The sons of Emmer, 1,052. The sons of Pasher, 1,247. The sons of Haram, 1,017. The Levites, the son of Jeshua and Kadmiel, the sons of Kadabiah, 74. The singers, the sons of Aspha, 128. The sons of the gatekeepers, the sons of Shalem, the sons of Ader, the sons of Talman, the sons of Akab, the sons of Hittiah, and the sons of Sheba, all in 139. The temple servants, the sons of Zaha, the sons of Hasapha, the sons of Tabath, the sons of Keros, the sons of Sahiah, the sons of Padon, the sons of Lebanon, the sons of Hagabah, the sons of Akab, the sons of Hagab, the sons of Shamlai, the sons of Hanan, the sons of Giddel, the sons of Gehar, the sons of Rehiah, the sons of Rezin, the sons of Nicoda, the sons of Gazim, the sons of Uzzah, the sons of Pesiah, the sons of Besai, the sons of Asna, the sons of Nehaim, the sons of Nepesim, the sons of uh, Bakbuk, the sons of Hakafa, the sons of Harher, the sons of Basleth, the sons of Mahida, the sons of Harsha, the sons of Barkos, the sons of Sisera, the sons of Tema, the sons of Neziah, the sons of Hadapha, the sons of Solomon's servants, the sons of Sotai, the sons of Hasapher, the sons of Peruda, the sons of Jela, the sons of Darkon, the sons of Giddel, the sons of Sephatiah, the sons of Hatil, the sons of Pachareth Hazabam, and the sons of Ami. All the temple servants and all the sons of servants were 392. The following were those who came from Tel Mala, uh, Tel Harsha, Cherub, Aden, and Immer. Although they could not prove their father's houses or their descent, whether they belonged to Israel, the sons of Deliah, the sons of Tobiah, the sons of Nakoda, 652. Also the sons of the priests, the sons of Habaiah, the sons of Hakaz, and the sons of Barzillai, who had taken a wife from the daughters of Barzillai the Gileadite, and was called by their name. These sought their registration among those enrolled uh, in genealogies, but they were not found there, and so they were excluded from the priesthood as unclean. The governor told them that they were not to partake in the most holy food until there would be a priest to consult Urim and Thummim. The whole assembly together was 42,360, besides their male and female servants, of whom there were 7,336, and they had 200 male and female singers. Their horses were 736, their mules were 245, their camels were 435, and their donkeys were 6,720. Some of the heads of the families, when they came to the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem, made freewill offerings for the house of God to erect it on its site. According to their ability, they gave to the treasury of the work 61,000 derricks of gold, 5,000 minons of silver, and 100 priests' garments. Now the priests, the Levites, some of the people, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the temple servants lived in their towns and all the rest of Israel in their towns.
This is the holy, perfect, and inerrant word of God. Praise be to God. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. This word is your word to us. We trust it. We know there is meaning in it. We search it, longing after you, seeking after you. All of God's word is breathed out by God. We confess that truth, and so we thank you for your word today. Please bless our time together. Bless my words and thoughts. They would be your words and thoughts. Help us not only to be hearers of the word today, but also doers. We pray this in the name of the Son and by the Spirit. Amen. You can be seated. You thought the genealogy of Matthew was pretty bad. This, that was just a warm-up for today. We read God's word because God's word, all of God's word, is inspired. Ezra and Nehemiah is not a book of the Bible which we often read together, but it is a book of the Bible which is so critically important. And so what I want to do as we study all of Ezra and Nehemiah, all these first two chapters today, is I want to place the importance on these people who were delivered. And so as we begin, as we, we look at the story that's unraveling here in Ezra and Nehemiah, beginning in Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, we see the first point, okay? And so looking at verses 1 through 4, we see... Uh, the first thing that happens, Cyrus makes a decree. Everyone repeat after me. Cyrus makes a decree. Well, who is Cyrus? Cyrus, he was the king and founder of the Persian Empire who took over the Babylonians originally, who originally captured the Jews. And so while the Babylonians took Judah out of, out of the land into captivity, uh, Cyrus of Persia, he took over the Babylonians. And this was actually pretty good news for the Jews. So because, you know, unlike the other kings... Cyrus actually had a lot of tolerance. He had a lot of respect towards non-Persians with their local customs and their beliefs. Um, he allowed them to participate in his government, practice their own religions. It was actually important to Cyrus that people practice their religions uh, properly. And so what was this decree which Cyrus gave? Well, simply put, it was that the exiled Jews in his empire would be allowed to return to their land, to Judah, to Jerusalem, to rebuild the temple there. And there are several really interesting things about this, okay? The first of these is if you look in verse 1, you see that actually God stirs up the spirit of Cyrus to make this decree. And so God gave Cyrus such a sense of urgency about this that this was one of Cyrus's first things he did. He did this within his first year in power over the Jews. And so uh, it's just a, it's a testament that God works in people's hearts to accomplish his will, just as he worked in Cyrus's heart here, uh, influencing his heart to accomplish his will, will for the Jews. But the bigger point, the bigger, more interesting thing here about this part of the text is that this is a huge fulfillment of prophecy, like a huge fulfillment of prophecy. If you look in verse 1, the prophetic words of Jeremiah are mentioned. I'll just read these words of Jeremiah here. Jeremiah 25, 8 through 13, Jeremiah writes, Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not obeyed my words, behold, I will send for all the tribes of the north, declares the Lord, and for Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants and against all these surrounding nations. I will devote them to destruction and make them a horror, a hissing and an everlasting desolation. Moreover, I will banish them from the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the grinding of the millstone and the light of the lamp. This whole land shall become a ruin and a waste, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then after 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, declares the Lord, making the land an everlasting waste. I will bring upon that land all the words that I have uttered against it, everything written in this book, which Jeremiah prophesied against all the nations. Then if you look in chapter 29, verses 10 through 14, Jeremiah writes, For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you can call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. 
So lots of fulfillments are happening here in this text. And so one, we see the exile obviously happened just as Jeremiah talked about it. True to Jeremiah's words, Israel, because of their disobedience, they were exiled to Babylon and their lands were laid to waste. The second of these fulfillments we see here is just the length of the exile. Cyrus's decree had happened around 539 BC. The exile, it happened around 600 BC. And so there's a few ways to look at this and record the dates. Um, but in every single instance, it's clear that Cyrus's actions fulfill the prophecy that the Jews would be freed from exile after 70 years. And the third fulfillment we see here is the return to Jerusalem. And so Jeremiah he said that God would bring the Jewish people back to Jerusalem. Cyrus's decree, it specifically allowed and facilitated the return of the Jews in this way to fulfill what was written by Jeremiah and rebuild the temple as Jeremiah re wrote about. Uh, and then finally, the fourth, commit, the fourth fulfillment we see here is the Babylonian judgment. Uh, just as it was prophesied that the king of Babylon and the nation would be punished, as Cyrus takes over, taking that power over, he's effectively carrying out the judgment of God. The fall of Babylon, the rise of Cyrus, it's actually an act of divine justice. It, fulfill, it fulfills this prophecy. But that's not the only prophecy that was fulfilled. Actually, about 100 to 100, 150 to 200 years earlier, God speaks through the prophet Isaiah, and he writes about Cyrus by name. He writes about Cyrus by name nearly 200 years before. This is actually one of the craziest parts of your Bible. Uh, it's something that should make you really trust God's word whenever you recognize. Long before Cyrus was born, long before he rose to power, Isaiah 44, Isaiah 45, it talks about him by name and says exactly who he would be and what he would do. And so in 45, 1, Cyrus is called his anointed. Uh, this is using the, the Hebrew word Messiah, which is the same title which is later used of Jesus. And this is a big deal because this means that Cyrus is God's chosen one. He's chosen by God for a, a very special purpose in God's sovereign, redemptive plan, despite not even being a Jew. Uh, in 45, 4 through 5, God says that even though Cyrus does not know or acknowledge God, God calls and equips Cyrus anyway so that he can be an instrument of God's will, literally calling him by name Cyrus. In 45, 4, this, we see the why. why. Why does he do this? Well, he does it for the sake of Israel. Why does God empower Cyrus in this, in this way? Well, it's because Cyrus's role, whether he knows it or not, is actually to benefit God's chosen people, the Jews. We look at verses 1 through 3, and it says that God holds his right hand. And so my wife, Jules, she sleeps with a sleep mask. And whenever she's sleeping at night, she gets pretty groggy, right? She also gets pretty sleepy oftentimes, too. And so she always sleeps with her full Stanley right on the nightstand. However, whenever she's got her sleep mask on, it's sometimes hard for her to, like, find it. And so she's wandering around, hitting me in the face, like, trying to find out where the Stanley is. And so sometimes I have to take her by the hand. I'm like, okay, here, here's your Stanley, or I hand the Stanley to her. But this is kind of the picture you see here. God in Cyrus is taking him by the right hand to accomplish his will in his life. And so all the things which Cyrus is accomplishing, it's actually coming from God. And so um, uh, God is sovereignly empowering him, all of the, subduing the nations, uh, giving him treasures, opening doors and gates. He's empowering him. He's weakening all the other nations so that this might occur. And what point does it all have? What point does all of this have? Why was Cyrus anointed for this purpose? Well, in Isaiah 45, 13, 200 years before, it says this. It says, I have stirred him up in righteousness, and I will make all his ways level, and he shall build my city and set my exiles free, not for price or reward, says the Lord of hosts. Isaiah 44, 28 says, He will say of Jerusalem, She shall be built, and of the temple your foundation shall be laid. Therefore, when Cyrus is making this decree, 150 to 200 years later, he's releasing the Jews, he's sending them off to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. He's fulfilling multiple of God's promises and prophecies here. He's, his taking over of Babylon was essential in God's plan for his chosen people, that he might free these people from their Babylonian captivity and empower them, right? Cyrus is empowering them through the empowerment which he has received to actually go off into this land and rebuild. 
And Cyrus, actually, he seems to be aware of this. If you look in this text, in his own decree, he recognizes God's hand upon his life. He clearly sees how the God of the Jews has given him all the kingdom all the, of the earth. That's what he says. And he has charged him directly to build the temple in Jerusalem. So I, I'm not sure how he figured out that, that this was a task which was placed directly on him. Maybe someone like Daniel, who would have been around during this time, he showed him this text in Isaiah. Um, that would make sense, that he understood what was written about him, that this was a call placed on his life. Maybe he d- received divine instruction another way. But however it happens, Cyrus he seems to understand his role in all of this as God's anointed one. And this is a pretty powerful lesson for us. This is a pretty powerful lesson for us, because God's providence is found everywhere in everything. God's providence is found everywhere in everything. What is God's providence? What is providence? Well, I, I talk about sovereignty a lot. Sovereignty is God being in control of all things. Providence is talking about in that sovereignty, because God has sovereign control over all things, he is leading all things to accomplish his good will. And so we see here a huge testament to the providence of God in someone such as Cyrus, not even a Jew. Cyrus, he serves as an instrument of God's providence. You see, God can use any person. He can use any event to accomplish his purpose, purposes, to fulfill his promise, to demonstrate his faithfulness to his people. And that includes you. You are an instrument of God's providence. You know, he may not be willing to use you in the same way he used Cyrus, but you have a purpose in the story that God is writing. Do you recognize that? If God is providentially using all people towards his goodwill, then he is still doing it now because our God is unchanging. He is immutable. He is always the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. You know, in some stories, (laughs) you know, you you think of your, your favorite stories. There are some characters you often wish weren't in it. Right? They're annoying, they don't serve any purpose towards the plot, they feel like they just get in the way. You just wish these characters didn't exist in the story. They're, they really shouldn't be there. They have no purpose other than to detract from the plot. For me, that's uh, the Star Wars sequels. And so who, who's seen the Star Wars sequels in, in the room? I love Star Wars, I hate the Star Wars sequels. And one of the biggest tragedies of the Star Wars sequels is the character Finn. Like, he could have been a really cool character, but they just butchered him, and he just got annoying in the way, all of that kind of stuff. I just wish they they either did something with him or got rid of him, because he just serves as kind of like a filler. And I want to focus on who actually matters in the story, rather than this side character who doesn't really serve a purpose. Did you know that (laughs) did you know that there's no person like that in the world? There is no side character who doesn't matter. There is no person in the world who is not valuable because every single person serves in one way or another to glorify our God, and our God has placed them there on this earth for that purpose. Every single person matters. There is no person who does not matter, and this is a representation of that. You matter. No matter how worthless you feel, God using Every person in the world, we see an example of him using Cyrus in this way. It's a representation of the fact that God uses every person in his providential will. We continue on, we read in verses 5 through 11, we see how the, the exiles respond. Right? The exiles respond, and just a reminder about what this decree means. All right? So we, we saw how uh, originally Cyrus made a decree, right? Here in verses 5 through 11, we see the exiles respond. Everyone say, the exiles respond. What are they responding to? Well, this decree, it's not just to return to the land. It's to rebuild the land. Make Jerusalem great again, right? That's the idea, okay? We're here, we're going off into the land, not just to occupy the land, but to make Israel uh, this glorious thing that it's meant to be to glorify their God. And there's significant purpose here. We have to remember the intention is not just to return. The intention is to rebuild. One commentator says, thus we see from the first, that the idea which characterized the restoration is religious. The exiles return as a church. The goal of their pilgrimage is a holy site. The one work they are uh, to aim at achieving is to further the worship of their God. That is their task. Now, how, the, how do the Jews respond to their task? Well, verses 5 through 6, we see a good number of them went, but the majority of these exiles Jews didn't go. 
It says that only those whose spirits God moved actually went. So even though the returning exiles were a minority, we have to recognize that they were a spirit-stirred minority. This was special. Just as God stirred Cyrus's spirit to action, we see in verse 1, and reflected in the Isaiah text we read, he stirred the spirits of these Jews to action too. You know, it was essential that God moved the spirits of these returning exiles because they're going to face many difficulties on their way back. Okay, this was not an easy task. There was a reason a lot of people wanted to stay in the land whenever they were given permission to go into the promised land. They wanted to stay in Babylon because the journey itself, it was long, it was dangerous, it was expensive. They were returning to a city in ruins, didn't have any homes, no roads, no city institutions. They didn't have any of the material resources they probably needed. They didn't um, have, have friends in the area. In fact, they had many enemies. The land itself was actually in the possession of another empire, And so that's why all those who were going, they were encouraged by those who were in Babylon, as Cyrus decreed, as they were going. It wasn't just a verbal encouragement. This encouragement wasn't just, uh, you know, you know, hey, attaboy, way to go. This was something that was physical. It was materials, practical provision for the journey that they were going on. And so if you want to ever encourage your pastor, okay, right, I will take, as they said, you know, silver, gold, livestock, that's, 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 that's fine, I'll take it. But this was how they were encouraging people as they went. And so we see in verses 7 to 11, as they go, Cyrus, he returns to them all these valuable treasures which were stolen from the previous temple. When Jerusalem was conquered, all these treasures were stolen, right? Because whenever the, the Israelites were, were sent into captivity in Babylon, uh, all the gold, all the silver, all that stuff was taken from them. But here Cyrus gives it back. So after conquering the Babylonians, I guess he's in in a pretty good mood. But this is significant because it fulfills even more of what Jeremiah had prophesied. In Jeremiah 27 through 21 through 22, it talks about this. And then the author, (laughs) the author decides to go into great detail about exactly what it was that was returned. And, you know, I get it. Maybe you think like, hey, I don't need to read a list of how many bowls and knives they had. (laughs) You know, why, why is that important to me? You know, 29 knives, in case you were wondering, how dare you forget. But you may not think this matters, but it's actually pretty important because the way this text carefully numbers all these articles shows how valuable these things are as symbols to the nation of Israel, to to, to Judah who's going back to Jerusalem. It symbolizes the restoration that is happening here. And so as we look at at, at chapter 2 finally, we see the final part of this little section. Uh, The exiles return. Repeat after me. The exiles return. We see this in all of chapter 2. And here we just see a list of families and individuals who made the return um, from exile to home. These are the people who went to Judah, Jerusalem, now that, was, uh, now that it was a, a province of the Persian Empire. And this is the list. This is the list which they gave. Uh, we see, you know, immediately those who were associated with Zerubbabel, the one who, who led them into the land. Zerubbabel himself was especially important, and so he was the appointed governor over the prince of the, the province of Judah. He was a descendant from the last reigning Judean king. And so as an heir to the throne of David, his presence in the story shows that the exiles, they're, ret- they're retaining their national identity as God's people in their return. Right? The point is really clear. This remnant of Israel is still Israel. This remnant of God's people is still God's people. Their identity is the same. It's not diminished. But despite their hardships, they're no less God's people. And so we see here several lists. In verses 3 through 35, we see a list of some families. 36 through 57, we see a list of the priests, the Levites, the temple workers. Verse 58, we see two special groups of servants. And then finally, in verses 59 through 63, several groups who claimed to be of the priestly lineage, but then could not prove their genealogy, and so they required special treatment. And after all of this, okay, after all of this, after this, you know, bog of reading different names, we get to verses 64 through 67, and we get a summary of all the people who returned. The entire group's about 50,000. 50,000 people, it says. However, you got to recognize this was only the first wave, and this only actually counted the heads of the household. This was probably somewhere in the realm of 100 to 150,000 people. And these were not, you know, all, all the Jews. Many of them were staying in Babylon, like we said, at least for a time. This was actually expected, though, because in, in Isaiah 10, 22, God promised that a remnant would return to Israel, and only a remnant. And so this is another fulfillment of prophecy. Finally, finally we get to the end of Ezra. Ezra 2 closes 
with the faithful remnant returning to Israel. And so in verses 68 through 69, the first thing it says they do once they finally get back into this land is begin making contributions towards fulfilling the pr- purposes given in chapter uh, 1, verses 1 through 4, originally whenever they received this, this decree. They're rebuilding the temple. They're giving sacrificially to this work. They're rebuilding. It says they gave generously, as generously as they could, according to their ability. And these offerings, whenever you give, it demonstrated their heart. Whatever you give, whatever you devote to, it demonstrates your heart posture. And this showed how they gave in, in whatever they had according to what they had. It shows how, value, how much they valued the house of God in their eyes. In verse 70, the final verse, we see the end of the section. And we see how they had, had finally been restored. After two generations... Think about what two generations is, right? After two generations in exile, away from home, they finally returned to this land which was promised to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. It was once again being fulfilled. And this is a humble new beginning. Think about it if you are a Jew returning to this land of your fathers, a land you've never been to. You're starting something new. You're returning to faithfulness. It's a humble new beginning. It doesn't look like much. But there's something special happening here. One commentator writes, There would soon be daily sacrifices to offer, many worshipers to attend to, and much work to supervise. And so this is a hopeful start. And as we continue studying this book in our future weeks, what we're going to read about is whether that hope is fulfilled or not. The people are back in the land. What's going to happen? There's so much hope brimming up. What's going to happen here? Okay, and so as we wrap up, you may be thinking, Parker, why are we reading this? That was a lot of names, bro. (laughs) That was a lot of names. I didn't need to hear that much about the, you know, king's silverware. Well, all scripture is God's word. And you may ask, okay, it's, it's God's word, but what's the relevance to me? Well, this is the relevance. This is why this book matters and why we're spending the time on it, why we read all of what we read today. It's because it teaches us something essential about God. And the essential truth about God that is being taught here is that every name matters. Your name matters because it is a part of God's providential will. Your name matters. In a world of people who tell you you don't matter or that your worth is determined by what they think of you or if you live up to this measure or that measure, Your name does not, your your name is actually, the worth of your name is determined purely by how you, uh, how, how, how you are thought of and spoken of by our God in heaven. What our God thinks of you is the only thing which gives you identity. Your identity is found in Jesus. You are dead and your life is now found in him. The providence of God is so incredibly evident in this book because seeing this providence how he's delivering this captive people, it's actually foreshadowing the gospel. You may not see the gospel here, but it is so evident whenever you look at what is being foreshadowed, what is happening here, God's people are being delivered from captivity. Over and over we see this pattern in scripture, God is repeatedly revealing that we worship a God who delivers his people from captivity. The exodus of God, the exodus that we read about from Egypt, it's a great Old Testament story that's repeated over and over and over again, talking about how God's people were delivered out of the, the, the area of Egypt into the promised land. In Ezra and Nehemiah, the release from this exile back into this promised land, it's repeating this story of deliverance from captivity and then looking forward to Jesus Whenever he dies on that cross, whenever he raises from the grave, he delivers God's people from their captivity, captivity to sin. Now Isaiah, he, he, had, he had before connected Cyrus with this idea of Messiah, right? He was call, Cyrus was called a Messiah, right? Anointed one who would save his people. When Jesus, though, when he, the promised Messiah, appeared, he is accomplishing what was foreshadowed in Cyrus, He he was foreshadowed in the exodus. He was foreshadowed here in in the exile, the release from the exile, the deliverance from the slavery and sin of death through his death on sinner's behalf. And so if you don't know Jesus, if you don't know Jesus, he has, like Cyrus, allowed you to escape from your captivity. Jesus has allowed you, he has released you to escape from your captivity of sin and find your home again. 
but find your home again in him. If you put your faith in him and receive salvation, you will have this deliverance which is promised. And so as we think about this, this is something which we need to be reminded of. This is the story of the Jews, and this is a story which every single one of us who are in Christ have been grafted into. We, under, we need to understand the story to which we have been brought into, and that's why we we're talking about this. We as Gentiles, we have became, we've become sons of Abraham in this incredible way. Understanding the story, it helps us understand our Savior and Lord Jesus better. That's why we're reading this book. And so as a reminder of that deliverance from captivity that we have experienced here in Christ, we're going to participate in something today called the Lord's Supper. Lord's Supper, it's a symbolic act whereby we as the church, through partaking of the bread uh, and the fruit of vine, we are memorializing the death of our Redeemer. We're looking forward to his second coming. And so as our elders, they come, they stand, they pray in a second, and as we pass out the elements, I want you to take some time to just reflect today. Reflect on this gift you've been given, a gift of deliverance. Reflect on this story you've been grafted into. The story which I told at the very beginning is not just a story that happened 2,500 years ago, you know, and before, you know, if you go all the way back to Abraham. This is a story which you are continuing today because you are God's people today. So as our elders come and stand, think about these things.